Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, today's lecture for Gov 3163 Media and Politics. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this new format, um, which I know is not ideal and is um, going to require all of us to sort of think a little bit differently about how we do things. But I'm hoping that as we get used to this new uh, reality that we live in, that we'll get used to this as well. So <clears throat> on tap for today, um, kind of want to get through the important stuff first. And honestly, this is what really matters to me a whole lot more than the content, which we'll have time to get to later. But first, I just want to offer some general thoughts about how this is going to work. And by this, I mean, our class, the rest of the semester, um, all of that stuff. And I also want to hear how you're doing. And obviously, this is a YouTube video, so I can't hear how you're doing, even if I am curious. Um, but I'm going to set up some discussion board posts in Canvas. And uh, I hope that if you have any questions about the course or questions um, in general, feel free to use that. Feel free to email me. Feel free to reach out to your classmates. Um, Etc. And also, I want to make sure that you're staying safe right now. Um, I know that all of us have a lot of things on our minds, um, and I hope that your own safety and the safety of your family is um, kind of front and center. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. And then I also just want to reiterate um, that all of us here at TWU, um, all of us are here to help you during this time. And we all realize what a less than ideal situation we're dealing with and we're here to help um, in any way that we can all right so with those caveats in mind after we get through some of that stuff we will also be talking about the less important things such as advising um, for the summer 2020 and fall 2020 semesters it's of course very important but like i said um, your health and safety right now is the most important thing to me um, and then we will talk about the midterm grades which as of now um, are posted in canvas for everybody um, a few of you are taking makeup tests um, today on monday um, and your grades will be posted soon and then finally we'll get to um, the material for tonight's class on constructing media campaigns um, during uh, presidential and um, political elections all right so first things first just generally how this is going to work um, i think it'd be helpful if i sort of tell you where i stand um, at, at any given time kind of when i'm recording these lectures so right now it's about 8 45 p.m um, I'm in Dallas and it's on Sunday night, um, March 22nd and I'm in Dallas and we just found out here, um, a couple hours ago that Dallas County, which is where my house is, is under, um, essentially a shelter in place order. And I spent some time talking to my wife about that tonight. Um, for us, that is not really going to change anything. We've been essentially sheltering in place since last Sunday. So we're kind of a week into it now. Um, my kids are home from school. Um, their daycare is actually open, but we have made the choice to not send them to school, um, especially because people, um, as you know, can be pretty asymptomatic and still be spreading the virus. So um, my kids are at home. My wife is also at home. Um, we are both trying to work from home and her job is very demanding, uh, much more so than mine. And so at this point, I am pretty much on um, kid duty during the day with a brief break at lunch. And then much like I'm doing right now, my plan is to work um, at night and get as much done at night as I can. So this is probably when I'll be recording most of these lectures. Um, hopefully they'll be uninterrupted, but don't be surprised if you hear something in the background. Um, you know, that's just the way that this is going to work. And so that's kind of my current situation. I'm feeling healthy. Everyone in my family is healthy. Um, we're trying to keep in close contact with friends and loved ones and exercising and staying busy as, as busy as we can, um, which I think is all that we can do right now. And I hope you're doing the same. So, all right, as for class content, um, as you are aware, because you're watching this right now, um, I'm going to be recording lectures and uploading them 
to a private YouTube channel um, that I created a few years ago for an online course that I was teaching and then also a hybrid course that I taught in the fall of 2017. You're free to go watch those videos if you want to, although um, there are many more entertaining things that you could be doing on your computer. But um, these videos will, for our class will be posted um, on that YouTube channel as well. Um, as for my office hours, I'm clearly not going to be in the office probably for the rest of the semester. Um, however, I am as accessible as possible on email. Um, if you would like to meet face to face, um, we could set up a Zoom um, conversation, um, just, just, you know, you and I. We could also find time to talk on the phone. Um, like I said, nights are best for me. Um, so we can try and make that work as best we can. As for the assignments for the course, so as you're aware, um, the media analysis paper, which you already turned in, is worth 15% of your grade. The midterm that you took um, the week before spring break, which God seems like forever ago now, is worth a quarter of your grade. So essentially what that means for us is that only 40% of your grade is currently accounted for. The rest of your grade, essentially almost all of it, was going to come from um, the final project. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about that because I know that some groups were sort of further, further along than others and that it was probably, um, you know, I don't know, I haven't heard from any of you, so I don't know if it was a relief or if it was frustrating that I canceled the group project. But at this point, it, it would just be frankly irresponsible to encourage you um, to meet, even if it was in a small group. And I, of course, would not expect you to venture out into the community um, to talk to people uh, to get their opinions on anything at this point. So um, the only practical thing I think to do was to cancel the group project. Um, and I hope that you're okay with that decision. Uh, it's okay if you're not, I'm willing to handle any criticism, so feel free to um, bring it my way. But in its place, I've added three assignments that are worth 30% of your grade, um, three discussion board posts. The first is gonna be due this Friday, March 27th. The second is gonna be due Friday, April 10th. And the third is gonna be due Friday, April 24th. I have not yet posted the question. Um, for this week, but I will uh, make sure that it's posted by the end of end of uh, the day on Monday. I am also going to offer an optional final exam that is worth 30% of your grade. Um, the reason why it's optional is because I don't want to force you into taking an exam that was never on the syllabus in the first place and also give you the chance um, if you scored high on the midterm, you can just use your midterm grade in place of that final exam grade. So essentially your fine, your midterm then would be worth 55% of your final grade. Um, and if your, your midterm was not what you wanted, then by all means take the final exam. Um, and the final exam will be, it'll be a, a, obviously a take home, um, probably open book, open note test that you have a few days to complete. All right, so those are the assignments, happy um, to go into them in, in more detail um, online, or if I get feedback that this is confusing, I can talk about it in class um, or in Wednesday's lecture. Um, and which, by the way, I'll be trying to post these videos on Wednesday, um, or I mean not on Wednesday, but in you know before each class on on Monday and Wednesday. So by 9:30 um, a.m. on Monday and Wednesday of each week. <clears throat> All right. The other thing I want to talk about that I think is affecting most of you or will affect most of you soon. So registration for seniors opens up at the beginning of April and course registration for the rest of you then extends throughout April. Um, as I think I've mentioned, I am the academic advisor for political science students who are specializing in legal studies, who have a concentration in legal studies. And um, this means that this time of year is a really busy time for me um, advising wise. And so all I ask of you um, is that you just remain patient with me. Feel free to um, email me if you're confused, but I'll talk a little bit more about this right now. So whenever you're searching for courses um, in WebAdvisor, if you're searching, and sorry, this is actually an error on the screen right now. So whenever you're searching for the summer, our political science courses at TWU will still have the prefix gov. 
So I know it says for summer search POLS, do not search POLS, search gov, G-O-V. However, for fall courses, use POLS. That is our new course prefix. It goes with the changing of the name of the department to history and political science. And so um, you can search Paul's POLS for our courses in the summer, so for ERF in the fall. Um, the website is not yet updated, but it will be soon. The Department of History and Political Sciences website is going to have some additional content, including the courses that are on offer during summer 2020, the courses that are going to be offered in fall 2020, and what courses are likely to be offered in spring of 2020. The reason why we're putting this on the website is that WebAdvisor is often wrong. Um, and it will tell you, especially if you're doing course planning, it's not really that web advisor is wrong, it's that course planning is wrong. So whenever you um, pull up a class in course planning, let's say this one, Gov 3163, and it might say this course is normally taught during the spring, that, that may or may not be true. Um, we're locked into these five-year course rotations and things change over time. So Whatever you find in WebAdvisor will be correct, but course planning can often be a little tricky. So we're gonna put this information directly on the website. So speaking of course planning, make sure that as you're thinking about which courses to take um, for summer, if you're going to take any during the summer and fall, make sure you're thinking strategically and check course planning about graduation requirements. And so pay particular attention to your core requirements, make sure that those 10 components are met Make sure that you're on track to meet the 120 hour minimum, which is required to graduate. Make sure that you um, have a plan to take all of the required courses for the major. And just know that during the summer, the university has been pretty stringent on cracking down on independent studies. And I don't even know if they'd be offered anyway, given the sort of uncertainty of the coronavirus. So um, don't rely on an independent study to get things done. And then finally, <clears throat> if you're currently registered um, or if you're currently enrolled as a BA student, know that that requires for political science majors um, 12 hours of foreign language. If you do not want to do 12 hours of foreign language, you need to change your major from BA to BS. And we can help you do that. Um, that's something that you can email me about. Um, and finally, I know that some of you um, work during the day and take time off to come to class and obviously you won't be coming to class this semester anyway but um, for the future just know that some courses are only taught at a specific time um, and specific days of the week. So speaking of fall 2020 courses um, this is a list of the classes that are being taught this fall. So there is a women as, women as citizens course um, taught by the new chair of the Women's Studies Department, um, Christine Bejarano. Jennifer Danley Scott is teaching the American Presidency. She's also teaching women in politics. I'm teaching law, politics, and public policy. That'll probably be on Monday, Wednesday. Um, Dr. Bourne is teaching Introduction to Comparative Politics. Um, Professor Housewright is teaching Police Policy and Practice. Um, Judge Ramsey is teaching Criminal Law. Um, Professor Henderson is teaching criminal evidence and procedure. Those three courses, police policy and practice, criminal law, and criminal evidence and procedure will either be online or hybrid. Um, Dr. Hoy is, of course, teaching modern political thought. This is a course that he only teaches during the fall semester. It is also a required course for many of you, so make sure that if you're wanting to graduate in the spring of 2021 and you have not yet taken this course, make sure that you register for it in fall 2020. Constitutional law, government structure is being taught by Van Erve um, in the fall. Um, constitutional law, individual rights is being taught online by Dr. Alexander and Karen Webb. And then Dr. Van Erve is also teaching a global law and legal systems course, which will be really interesting. It's a, essentially a comparative law class. Dr. Brock is teaching seminar in public policy, which is a required course for many of you as well. Dr. Hoy is teaching political science, scope and methods, also a required course for um, some of you. So these are the courses that are being offered during the fall. All right, so if you go into WebAdvisor and search them, they will come up, you will find them, you can see what days of the week um, they're being taught. Um, like I said, some of them are online, some are Monday, Wednesday, some are Tuesday, Thursday, and some are hybrid. So make sure that you um, are thinking sort of strategically about which classes that you wanna take. And of course, I am here um, to answer any questions 
that you may have. All right. <clears throat> so now that we've got those sort of caveats um, out of the way, let's talk a little bit um, about the content, um, which is how um, advisors, media advisors for political candidates design um, media efforts during political campaigns. And so <clears throat> the big question, and this is sort of a question that has been raised a lot um, in our class, but just with respect to media and, um, you know, not with campaigns in, in particular, but in a political campaign, what tends to come first? Is it campaign discourse or the issues that people care about? And actually, before we jump into this question, I know I said we'd talk about the midterm. I think I'll actually hold off and talk a little bit more about the midterm exam on Wednesday after um, the people who need to take the makeup have taken it. So we'll cover it then. Um, all right, back to the topic at hand. So what comes first, the campaign's discourse or the issues that people care about? Well, as you might expect, it's complicated, right? Campaigns are actually built on these very dynamic interactions of citizens, candidates, and the news media. So again, um, the relationship here is not a linear one, right? It's not like politicians have a message, the media transmits that message, and the citizens all receive that message in exactly the same way. That's not how this works. That's sort of a hypodermic needle model, which as you guys know, is outdated. So instead, these are dynamic um, two-way interactions. And there's a really interesting case study on this, and I don't think that I included it as a signed reading, but it's worth talking through just a little bit. And it's from um, a professor of political communication named Marion Just. And she wrote this book about the 1992 presidential campaign, which was George H.W. Bush, um, of course, running against Bill Clinton, who ended up winning. And just ask some really interesting questions, and, and you'll see how this relates to agenda, agenda setting in a second. But she asks about the kind of discourse that the public wanted and expected during this presidential campaign. Um, she also wants to find out which issues were most important to candidates and voters. This is the agenda setting component of her study. And she also was interested in how people wanted the actors um, to carry the discourse. And this and actors here includes both um, the behaviors of both the candidate as well as the mass media. And so she goes through some previous um, presidential campaigns. 1972, for example, between George McGovern and Richard Nixon was dominated by economic, social, and foreign policy issues. The 1976 presidential campaign um, between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter was dominated by this concept of a stagnating economy as well as rising inflation, which leads to the term stagflation. The 1980 campaign between Reagan and Carter was dominated by inflation as well as America's sort of position in the world and wanting to reposition it as sort of a beacon of power and of strength. The 1984 and 1988 elections were broadly diffused over sort of myriad issues from foreign policy to um, shrinking the size of government. And what about 1992? That's the question that Just asked. And so she finds that, in fact, it was the economy that overrode all other issues in the 1992 campaign. That's the issue that voters cared the most about. And they ended up figuring this out by using large N survey data. And an N, of course, is the size of a sample um, that comes from a population. And so a large N study is typically a study that would interview or poll or survey a couple thousand respondents. And so theirs was even larger than that. 83% of the people who participated in their study cited the economy as their number one concern. Then they augmented that data with in-depth focus group interviews in four geographically diverse communities throughout the United States. And they were really interested not only in how this agenda was, was created, but also how static or dynamic it was over time. And so they asked the question about whether the agenda got richer and more diverse as the campaign progressed. And the answer was no. People indicated that as this presidential campaign progressed, they were increasingly sick of the mudslinging, the scandal mongering, the manipulation, and the lying. And in fact, disgust with campaign practices themselves was, was widespread. The majority of interviewees in all four 
geographic areas indicated this. And this is really an interesting finding um, because we see that what is dominating the proceedings, yes, the economy was, was front and center, but also what was front and center was the very tenor um, and tactics of the campaign itself. And so the campaign then is almost as much news as the issues that the campaign um, kind of purports to deal with. And so uh, this is how sort of political campaigns can take on a life of their own. <clears throat> So one other question that's worth posing is trying to figure out how people think about and respond to various campaign communications. And we know the sort of myriad channels that elites and politicians will communicate to us. Um, local TV news is one. National TV news, of course, is another. Long-form interview programs, candidate ads, and then way down at the bottom, but it shouldn't be, um, is, of course, the Internet. And we've talked a lot in this class about how candidates use the internet um, to communicate directly with, with the people um, that they hope to get to vote for them, um, that whether that's using Twitter, whether that's using Facebook Live like Better O'Rourke did, whether it's cleverly using Instagram um, or even mining Facebook for data, which is something that we'll talk about on Wednesday when we talk about the way that the Trump campaign used um media in 2016 and is using it now in 2020, um, particularly paid media in order to drive the agenda. And this begs the question, which is, do people use information differently depending on the source? So for example, if somebody is getting information directly from a candidate, um, how is that information used by a voter in order to determine their opinion about the candidate compared to information that is mediated or comes through mass media. And research has demonstrated that people tend to interpret political information, and this includes ads, it includes news and interviews, by relying to different degrees depending on the person, on one, their prior knowledge, two, their personal experience, and three, other media information that can come along with that message. And so what Just and her co-authors did is they conducted surveys throughout the duration of this campaign, which were then, as I mentioned, augmented with focus group data from their four geographic areas. And they ended up finding that by and large, people were tired of the election, but they thought that the media was doing a pretty good job. Around half of the respondents thought this. And we'll talk sort of later, um, whether it's tonight or Wednesday, about whether or not you think that these numbers would still hold up. But there were some complaints. People tended to disapprove of horse race coverage. They tended to disapprove of coverage that was obsessed on candidate strategies, as well as how candidates were stumping on the campaign trail. Um, this is really interesting. This kind of falls right in line with what Lance Bennett complains about when he talks about media coverage of politics is this um, focus on, on the dramatization aspects of it, who's up, who's down, who's winning, who's losing, who's ahead, who's behind. They also claimed that the media tended to distort reality. They would take lines out of context. They would focus on the controversial or catchy sound bites. And so, of course, Bennett's biases apply here. Um, in fact, we can see evidence of all of them. Um, save maybe the authority disorder bias, which is not something that you would see most candidates having to deal with that type of bias coverage, but instead people who are already in elected office. They also look at differences between responses to ads and responses to news. And we'll talk more about political ads a little bit later. But the question is, are people more likely to ignore, follow, or transform messages depending on the source of information, right? So if, if political information is coming to you from, let's say, Twitter, an uninterrupted Twitter feed from a candidate, is that information likely to be ignored by you? Is it likely to be followed by you, et cetera? And how does this relate to the 2020 presidential election? And sort of more pressingly, I think, how does it relate to what we're all dealing with now, um, how does it make you feel to see the president um, giving a news conference every afternoon about coronavirus and the economic ramifications and the economic impacts of the things that are going on and the health impacts? Um, so all of this is very dynamic and it's very fluid and it's changing 
in real time. Um, and that's all I want to talk about for tonight. Um, I want you to think a little bit more about um, what role the media plays in political campaigns. We'll continue talking through this. Um, we'll talk about it much more on Wednesday. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to reiterate a few things. I want to reiterate um, the fact that I am very sorry that our semester um, has been upended in this way. And um, you guys have been a phenomenal class so far. I've had a wonderful time getting to know all of you and getting to meet all of you and getting to talk about media and politics with you. And I hope that we can find some way to continue um, the sort of spirit of, of the class, even if it's going to be taking place in a different form. And I also wanted to say, too, um, that there are a lot of things to worry about in the world right now. And I don't want you to worry too much about our class. Um, at the end of the day, this is just a grade. And uh, it's not life or death. Okay, so I want you to be safe. Um, I want you to take care of yourselves and your families and um, be smart about this, this changed world that we're living in, um, at least for the time being. And finally, I want to talk about um, what I have sort of mentioned numerous times during the semester. And of course, back then the stakes were not as high, but I just want to say that if any point you feel um, overwhelmed by all of this, um, feel free to opt out of, of consuming media for a little while. Um, this has made me change my habits. Um, I was always just sort of grab my phone first thing when I woke up and scroll through my Twitter timeline. And about four days ago, um, I realized that it was making me feel really bad and it was making um, things seem worse. And kind of most importantly, it was leading me to focus on things that I had no control over. And um, I found that that was affecting the way that I was doing things that I did have control over. And so I would urge you to think about those distinctions. Um, it's really easy right now to uh, just be inundated with bad news. And while it's important that we all know what's going on, I want you to think about your own personal circle and how much information you need in order, in order to keep that personal circle as happy and healthy and as productive as possible. And so on that note, I will sign off. Um, I hope that all of you have a great day and please feel free to email me, um, if you have any questions about any of this. All right. Talk to you on Wednesday.